Hey, folks, this is Scott with Leading Edge Archery, and Jason's got a new toy. I do. I'm he, so excited. He thinks he's a DJ. <laughs> hey, one of these days, one of these I'm going to surprise you guys, and I'm going to be spinning records at an EDM concert somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> what's, your, what's your DJ name? Yeah. DJ Wheels. <laughs> DJ <laughs> Wheels. There it is. Well, hey, we're back after what? God, a year and three yeah. months. It's been a while. Yeah, for sure. And we're going to actually do something different this year. We're actually doing this on video, um, which will be posted on YouTube. Um, Ryan Serber back here, our video guy, has <clears throat> uh, been gracious enough to meet us. And and who decided to do this at 730 in the morning? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, it's this guy right here. No. Um, but no, we're back after a long hiatus, and it was kind of cool because we got a lot of people that were talking to us about, you know, when are you coming back? Um, you know, a lot of tournaments we shot. We'll get into that later, but um, I think we made an impact a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, I've cool. been hearing people stopping anybody with an LEA jersey, asking them about when the podcast is coming back. And I guess there's a lot more people out there listening than I yeah. imagined. <laughs> Thank you guys for that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So we're going to talk about what, just kind of what we've been doing for the last year, kind of get an intro and then maybe share with some guests we got coming on. Cause I know Jason, you got a whole line of them right yeah. now. I've been, I've been busy trying to make some connections and bugging people out there and you gotcha. know, just seeing who wants to come out and talk. And yeah. surprisingly, there's a lot of people that were interested. In yeah, out. exactly. You know, it's kind of weird because we were kind of on a roll, but Last January, I think it was February. Yeah. And then that whole uh, big C word happened. And uh, it was crazy. You know, I don't know how much we want to get down the rabbit hole of COVID, but, um, yeah. you know, it shut down the, the shop for just a little bit. Yeah. Um, it was weird for sure. Not sure where the business was going to go. And uh, we got lucky and, man, it actually helped the archery industry. I was about to say everything kind of started booming after that people were getting bored and what is the one thing you can do in your garage and in your backyard <laughs> even in an apartment you know uh one of my teammates leah the line bail exactly she was <laughs> shooting i think from her hallway into her bedroom mm -hmm. 10 15 feet it's crazy yeah you can still do it so yeah it was weird it was a weird time um we were doing i think bridger and i were covering the shop doing all pickups and I'm not going to lie. We pretty much invited people. <laughs> I mean, it was quote unquote by appointment, but yeah, most of the time we were just kind of hanging out in here and somebody yeah. dropped by here's exactly. the door. Here's somebody trying to open the door and we'd like yeah. crack the door and see who it was. That was, that was in between Bridger mastering his, uh, his nine irons and we put yeah, a, set up a golf net his, in here. We did. We set up a golf net in the side of the shop. It was awesome. <laughs> you guys had a golf net, a CrossFit gym. Oh, we had, we had exactly. I think one of our local CrossFit places, uh, Hill Country, they let us have some equipment, which was awesome. Yeah. Um, and like I said, a lot of golf balls. I think Bridger probably played as much Call of Duty as I've ever seen a human being play in about a three month span. <laughs> Yeah, I remember I remember him talking about the new Call of Duty. I used to play it on my phone yeah. with Adam and, and Bridger and, and Cody. All of a sudden, we get locked up, and I'm like, man, I don't have a new Xbox, and all these guys are <laughs> playing. So I went online, ordered an Xbox, yeah. got online, and started playing with these guys. Um, oh, so you were a part of that crew. It was, yeah. it was you, me, and the hooligan. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yep, hanging out with the hooligan. That's awesome. Getting beat by little kids. <laughs> exactly. Little Timmies. Yeah. Well, it's funny because I, we have a, one of our customers is the, uh, he's one of the engineers for our local internet provider. Mm -hmm. And he said that during COVID, the, their, their bandwidth was maxed out like it was Christmas morning, you know, when everybody's doing videos, yeah. chats and stuff. And so it was like that nonstop. You know, between schools doing online classes, guys playing, you know, on the internet with, uh, with all the online gaming and probably everybody surfing the internet all day. Streaming. And streaming movies. And it was crazy. It was a crazy time. Yeah, I rewatched so many shows. I think I rewatched Game of Thrones as well. I know <laughs> Did it, you really? It's really long to watch that, the whole eight seasons. Yeah. Did you ever watch it? 
Still I'm, have it. I'm still, I'm one of the people that have never seen an episode That's of Game of Thrones. And I will stay that way the rest of my life. And no, not you, not because I don't want to so watch it, but like it's just out of spite now because yeah, everybody tells, everybody has that reaction. Because it makes no see. sense. This guy is a Star Trek, Star Wars geek, geek boy. And it's just right up your alley. It makes no I know, sense. But it's it's more fun to have somebody be upset at me for not watching it than it is for me to. You watch know, it. you know, he's going to secretly binge watch it one day. I know, and he's it, not going to tell anybody. It'll happen. <laughs> all all it's, all it's going to take is for you to watch one episode. You'll be like, "All right, I got to watch them all." Holdin', I'm holding fast here. He's crazy. I was the same way. Then I watched Star Wars. It took me till I was thirty-two to watch my very first Star Wars movie. Yeah, and then I watched them all. And then I wondered why I wasted that time in my life. Cause, really? Yeah, I mean, the first three were good. The original three were good. They were. And then the following remakes or whatever, the prequels, I just thought they were really cheesy and corny. Well, you know what they did? I think they, it looks like, I always felt like I was in a track meet watching yeah. it. They always tried to to get too much content in one movie and back and forth, back and forth. Yeah, and so anyways covid was weird it was um but it was it did actually help the shop we probably got more busy than we've ever been um you know from a target archery standpoint it shut it down completely yeah i mean bridger you shoot professionally and there was just nothing well heck on. from well because it was the weekend before or the week before nationals yeah nfa and international yeah, exactly and everything was gone for about <clears throat> oh probably three six four months yeah or longer. What did we we shot in ASA? I think was the first. Yeah, it might have been London. Might have been one of the first yeah. ones back, and then yeah, because they canceled the, Benning. I remember that. Canceled Benning. Canceled the Paris. Headed. Did we shoot Paris? Mm -mm. No, I think it canceled. No, they canceled it Paris. Yeah, I think London was the first one I went to, and then OPA and a couple of NFA events. And I mean, you guys shot Foley. <clears throat> Yeah, but that was that was in that February. was the classic, and that yeah. was that was in February. Well, we shot February there, and then we shot it for the classic mm -hmm. later on in the year because it's the only event venue that would host it. Um, so for you, it had to be a really weird time because for the first time in your career, it was. And what you, you I felt, mean, probably felt like you weren't shooting for anything. It was the first time in ten years I had more than like a three week break. <laughs> yeah. Besides hunting season, obviously. That is the one thing that did not end last year. What's that? Hunting. No. You know, that's you know happened, it, it did and it didn't. You know, a lot of the guys couldn't travel internationally yeah. or even just to here in the in the states. I mean, there was, I think, what, four or five western mountain states shut down their non-resident hunting, mm -hmm. which was unprecedented. No, of course. That scared the crap out of me, you know. All the... All the elk hunters and everybody that we have coming through here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I didn't apply for my tags at, for any state last year for the first time because I was worried about what was going to happen. You know, I didn't want to be stuck with an $1,100 elk tag in my yeah, pocket and not be able to go. Not be able to travel. Yeah. You know, I, that was that was just so weird because when that happened, you and I were gearing up to go to Mexico. Yeah, exactly. We are going to go to the Pan Am Games. and. Yeah. Our, you know, I was I was trying to be hopeful. I was, yeah, I was I trying to be optimistic. I was being the pessimist. <laughs> and you kept on saying they're going to shut it down, and they're going to shut it down, and I didn't believe it until we got that message about a week right before we, we left. And, yeah, that yeah, sucked. Just came so in any, here. Yeah, a the, weird time. Put the bow away and picked up, picked up a hunting bow. You know what's funny? A lot of people I know have questioned me, you know, why didn't you just do the podcast? But, man, there's so many uncertainties, you know. Yeah. Do you, do you keep rolling at it and... And it probably would have been a big hit because I think, uh, I know I listen to some podcasts mm -hmm. because there's nothing else to do. Yeah. Um, being bored. Uh, but yeah, we were just trying to keep the business afloat, trying to keep lives in a state of normalcy and, and we got through it and uh, <clears throat> come out the other side actually really good as a shop at least. And I think the industry as a whole is coming through it. Um, but on top of that, the demand and the supply chain, because, you know, it's, it's no secret. A lot of the parts that go into archery come from overseas. Yeah. And, uh, man, that's been a tough, tough, tough deal for us. Um, and not just us, any retailer out there, any dealer that carries archery equipment, and it's just not archery. You know, we have customers that come in that, you know, I had a, one guy, he's a boat general manager for a boat company. Can't buy a boat right now. Can't mm -hmm. get RVs. I've heard that if you have a, a side by side, you know, like a ATV, and it's broke right now. It's six months yep. just to get parts. Um, our local guy down here has got a 
parking lot full of them, you know, waiting for parts. So it's just crazy. Yeah, and it's and it's going to continue. And unfortunately, there's other things happening in the world right now that are just going to impact this. Yeah. I, uh, I was actually talking to somebody from Truval. I called yesterday to order a part, and we got into talking. And I mentioned I'm in the market for a new truck. It's like, man, I feel so sorry for you. I said, yeah, I know, because a lot of the electronics for trucks are going to be on back uh, on the back burner right now because of the drought in Taiwan. Um, all the microchips and stuff that they right. Uh, put in trucks and stuff they get made in Taiwan so they're in a drought and I think one of their main factories burnt down all the water's got to be redirected to residents and it takes a lot of water to make those chips really so trucks from what I hear I mean that's you're going to be or cars in general you're going to be on a waiting list for about eight months to get a car and the prices are probably going to skyrocket well they already are and they're going to keep going and going and going Um, yeah I mean it's a weird time for sure. It is. And that's, you it's know, the end of the world, <laughs> but yeah, it's, uh, it, the, the supply chain on the archery side has been tough. Um, arrows are hard to get. Bows yeah. of course are hard to get. I, heck I've been doing a, a bi-weekly video, um, just to talk through it, to try to maybe sh- slow down some of the phone calls of where's my bow because it's constant. Um, and trust me folks, we, we, we want to get you that, that piece of equipment as bad as anybody. It's just, man, it's just hard right now. Accessories or. Oh, there is, there are two site manufacturers. I won't name them that are out 24 plus weeks right now. Yeah. 24 weeks. That is a half a year. Yeah. I, I called yesterday to check up on a site. They said it was maybe a three and a half month wait. Yeah. Before it even gets built and, yeah. and then ships. So it's like, Hey, you know what? I'm good. Yeah. Well, and it's going to, it's going to impact a lot of shops. I mean, and even us, how we buy and what we buy, because we're going to try to play that, that, that juggling act of you look at lead times. Now you order it today, you get it, let's say in August, September, you got new equipment maybe being released in October, November. How much do you buy to be possibly stuck with last year's model? Exactly. And that's going to be the uh, the tough part of this moving forward. It's going to be crazy. And we should invent a site that we could 3D print. Yeah, no kidding. I'm surprised uh, Colby's surprised. not already on that. <laughs> Hell, Colby's, well, I mean, Ultraview, what's he got, Bridger? Probably 12 machines now. Bro. He's got a bunch. I know. He's got a bunch. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm pretty sure that ALC is now completely taken over by Colby's business. Yeah. George probably sits in an office and shoots his bow in there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's definitely been crazy last year, but yeah. So at Bridger, why don't you talk here. about, about the, uh, you know, we cut, when we got back to normal shooting target archery about three months, four months ago when at the start of Foley, uh, I mean like a normal schedule. Yeah. I mean, we got back to shooting would have been well, like right around June. Yeah. End of June, beginning of July last year to try to close out the 2020 season. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, we had some stuff. I mean, the last half of the ASA season was there. Um, had OPA, NFA did their big roundup deal in September. Um, hey, let's take a step back. Um, you like kicked ass at OPA. That was a good tournament. <laughs> I mean, three legged ninja. Yeah, he 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 stroked it. He's being kind of modest right now. Um, he you had a great tournament for real. Yeah. yeah, they numbered the, so the, okay, for the people that haven't watched it or haven't seen the shoot off for that, I made shoot off there going in in second place yeah. and shot a zero on my second scoring arrow. <laughs> okay, so we got to talk about that it, real okay, quick because it was they, hilarious. <laughs> so they, they, they numbered the targets from right to left instead of left to right. Which you would think common sense left to right. Yeah, like yeah, the way you exactly. would read a paper, but they were yeah. like, Target one was clear on the right and target five was clear on the left. Right. And I went through and wrote down all the distances so I wouldn't have to range it. Like right. stepping up onto the stake, I just set my sight and go. Right. And I just looked at, I wrote it down when I walked through, I walked through from left to right, thinking that the longest target being Bigfoot was right. going to be the last target. And it was the first target. And when we moved from, instead of going from left to right, we moved from right to left. And I looked at the second number which was the second shortest or second. Uh, it was the shortest because you, you shot that one short. I shot that one, and then, but the second target 
like I went clear over and it was supposed to be like a 60 something yard wolf. wolf and I set yeah. my sight for like 47. <laughs> right. <laughs> Folks, if you get a chance, you need to go back and watch it. Cause it's kind of funny now that you know the backstory. Cause I'm watching it live and I see Bridger shoot and he's got this be- look of bewilderment on his face and I'm can't, I can't figure out what it is. I'm thinking, okay, well maybe he stroked it and it was perfect or yeah. something. You know, and then he pulls his phone out. It's classic. And he looks at it. <laughs> he, he looks at the target and I think Levi was commentating at, and said something like, I think Bridger missed that. I, I was looked like, at, oh my. <laughs> I looked at the target. I'm like, huh. I looked at my phone. It said, for, my phone said 47. So I'm like, okay. I got that. I right. looked at my sight. I'm like, what the hell? My sight's on 47 <laughs> yards. Like, how come I broken the 12 ring? What do I have? A, yeah, it's exactly. not in there. And then I look. And so the Bigfoot's standing at 100. So I'm like, all right, 47. That's like halfway. And I like looked at that target and I'm like, that's a lot farther away than halfway <laughs> between right. here and that Bigfoot. Yeah. And I like looked at the, the target t- or the target number tacked onto the butt end of the target. And yeah. I'm like target two. wait, they're backwards. And I looked down to the and then actual number it and it was like 67 yards. We set myself by like 20 yards. Just exactly. not thinking about it. Yeah. That was a tough one for sure. Cause you were on a roll and you, you and actually you had a great year period. I mean, Overall, shot good. Shot good. The first day, the classic there was yeah. leading after the first day. Yeah, and then just kind of petered out the last ten targets of the second day. Yeah, just you shoot had, off. And you had a heck of a season, though. I know. I think uh, we had figured out you were elites, one of elites, top guys last year. So, um, going into the twenty twenty one season, um, it was kind of like I said, we had an antiquated kind of ASA season. It was we got about the last half of it. You know, and they were really attended well. Um, yeah, there was a lot Fo- of people. I think Foley had their highest attendance ever. ever. Yeah. Paris definitely did. They had like over 1,700. Normally they're yeah. like around 11. Right. I think. So. Yeah, it was crazy. I mean, even, been, even, even last year, the 2020 ASAs that did happen once they, they got some of their COVID mitigations. All right. There's still a lot of people going out there. Oh, yeah. Well, it was the only game in town. Exactly. Yeah. I remember you messaging me and going, I cannot believe how many Hoyts are out here. Yeah. These must be USAC guys. <laughs> well, it's funny you say that. We've seen more people cross pollinating into other disciplines you don't typically see. Oh, absolutely. You know, it's one thing about archery, and I've always thought this, and we encourage our archers here to not do this, but they get pigeonholed in one discipline. Mm-hmm. And to see them jump over the fence was kind of cool. It helped ASA for sure. It was the only game in town, like yeah. Bridger said. And, um, and it helped grow the sport tremendously within a very short time frame and what's kind of cool too is i remember going to foley uh, was a foley the classic and we were kind of all worried about masks and how it's going to work and bridger <laughs> did you guys see a mask in fond du lac wisconsin oh no that no. was like <laughs> business as usual up business, there. yeah exactly and then a foley we didn't see any down there at all well that's just alabama <laughs> <laughs> yeah so you live alabama. in alabama you're immune yeah exactly <laughs> Dude, so i'm sure we told you about this when we were there for the the, just the regular Foley tournament, yeah. for, you know, a month or two ago. Like there's this little uh, seafood place we always go to and they their Friday night special was mullet. Oh, man. <laughs> like the bait fish mullet. That's bait fish, exactly. Y'all, it's an Alabama hot dog. It's good. <laughs> That's what the gal said. They sold out. They sold out? We went with one of our staff shooters, Destin, oh, and then gosh. Courtney and her family. Yeah. And like Destin was like, oh, what the hell, I'll, I'll order it, I'll try it. I mean, it just tastes like fried catfish like i was gonna ask you is it it's good? just tastes like it's just it's tastes like bad. fried fish it tastes fine but so he literally got the last basket if wow. you're driving they were completely sold out if you're driving along highway 98 going through florida you know you go through pensacola destin right once you get past destin into panama city and, and port st joe and all that they have these little like hot dog stands on the side of the road that sell fried mullet kind of like boiled peanuts this is gross. No, it's not. It's it's, <laughs> it's not okay. that bad. Like it just tastes like fried fish. Yeah, you're just a very picky you, eater. You, you know they cast net those. Oh, I know. Oh, okay. I mean, I, I they use don't them. catch them. No, I use them for bait. Yeah, exactly. They're That's bait my fish. point. Yeah, they're bait yeah. Fish, but they're clean. I mean, they're yeah. Like any other not fish, bad. you but get the red again, line out of it. Uh, it probably tastes fine. I was gonna say Absolutely. you you two eat some really weird stuff, so it doesn't surprise me. Well, yeah, we're outdoorsmen. Yeah. Okay. I draw the line in some places. Bait fish. 
negative. I mean, you're like crappie, right? Oh, yeah. That's, that's not a fish. No, that's a... Don't disrespect exactly. crappie like we're that. From the, we're northerners, man. Crappie is like a delica- delicacy. So I, I went in and caught probably about 30 crappie one day at a, at a spillway in Alabama, and then I went down on a offshore fishing trip, and I had a bunch of butterfly crappie that I was using to catch grouper, and somebody next to me flipped out. Oh, yeah. I bet they did. But I was using that small fish to catch a really big fish. That was yeah. way better. Made okay. way better sandwiches and tacos. <laughs> Oh. But I get it, yeah. Yeah, crappie's good. But anyway, but no, no, Alabama. Well, like I said, it was uh, it was cool because the mask mandate thing was a non-existent feature at most of the tournaments. It actually still is to today. I mean, yeah. they're I think they're doing all their due diligence as far as requesting it or mandating it on their paperwork. But we never, we really never seen it, um, which made life a heck of a lot easier. You know, it's uh. And the sport, like I said, it grew tremendously. And the first two tournaments out of the gate this year for ASA have, have been just unbelievably attended. I think 20 to 30% growth. At least. Yeah. And it's been, uh, honestly, uh, they're going to have to look at potentially the venues. I mean, Paris mm-hmm. can't accommodate that number of people. I heard it was a we, really, I didn't go for the first year in a while. And Bridger, you were there. It's It was crazy. I was nuts. I mean, they... Every hotel room in that town was booked. There was, yeah. I know Cassidy and uh, Lindsay Christensen had to stay like almost an hour away. Right. A lot of people were like that, having to stay, you know, they're yeah. up in Oklahoma or at the casino, you know, 20, 30 minutes away right. or what have you. Because I, like, I booked our hotel in like, like probably like January. Yeah. To be able to make sure to have a room. And even when I booked it back then, they only had like two rooms left. Left, yeah. That's crazy. Well, imagine if they had ASA San Antonio, you know, if I had my druthers, I would put it in a, uh, there's one thing about ASA and I think it's, well, it's not, yeah, the small towns, they're always in these mud traps. I mean, when you're, when your gear list requires you to have muck boots, that's a problem. I don't, I don't think there's, I've ever shot an ASA where I haven't worn at least like, like crispy hunting boots. Yeah. Some kind of water resistant stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's always, 100%. it's always a mess. And some of that's just nature bad of the luck. beast because well, we're bad, a bad luck, but B, bad luck. just being in the Southeast. Well, mm-hmm. I know uh, we, there was a, somebody had talked about it in Paris that hadn't rained in like two or three months. They were kind of excited. The courses were probably, and then what Friday? Like oh, the day, oh, <laughs> yeah. Friday afternoon was the, like the a deluge. deluge. Yeah. <laughs> and then, well, the week before too, they got pounded with rain. Yeah. It's like, just as soon as ASA, you mention it, it's rain. It just happens. It's part of it. Yeah. So if your town's ever in a drought, just, just post an it. ASA, post an <laughs> ASA pro am and you'll get about six inches of rain in two weeks. Exactly. This is true. So Jason, what about the, on the USAT side of it? Um, it? That just got shut down. Oh, it was, it was down completely. So the last, the last podcast we did, Bridger and I were talking about how the, para requirements were completely wiped out right they didn't want us traveling they didn't want us doing anything so some people still went out but you know you were competing in the able-bodied classes right i decided to just call it quits for the year and stay home and shoot and i mean i shot every single day um but i did something that i never thought i would do i went and shot a 3d tournament oh yeah i remember that and after talking crap for three or four years i was like this is a lot of fun. Yeah. I need to, I need to definitely practice for this. Um, so, you know, I still shot my, my USAT bow. Right. I still did my 50 meter stuff and practiced every day, but I, I got, I got more and more involved in the 3d thing. Yeah. So I went and did it with a regular target setup, did it with a hunting setup and now I'm, I'm hooked on it. Yeah. So it's a lot of fun. Still, still working on the USAT stuff. But USAT as an organization has started to come back. What this year? I think they first, yeah. they threw their first. They've tournament. been hosting their hosting their tournaments this year. <laughs> but yeah. aren't they? So I don't. I I haven't followed it. But aren't they running a very 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 limited field? So they did that last year, uh, based on state requirements. Right. Um, and this year, as more states are opening up, the requirements are getting a little bit more lenient. So there's a there's a little bit higher attendance. I know Arizona was one of the most restricted ones. Um, so what they did was they, they separated the para division completely. Right. Um, 
and gave us pretty much our own tournament and our own trials for Tokyo. Um, and that opened up a lot more slots for people to go shoot gotcha. on, the, on the regular Arizona. As far as Gator Cup, we did the same thing. They separated Gator Cup for para. Um, and then the actual able body Gator Cup is this weekend. Right. But Florida has no limits. So are, are they still running two people to a, a target? Or are I they believe they, they are. Yeah, so that, that, but that essentially cuts that field in half. Yeah, but they're running two fields. Gotcha. Uh, they were they were running two fields. They were running like two or three shooting times. They found a way to make it work. Yeah. So, yeah, we'll see with with Florida. Even though it's open, the USOPC still has their own mandates. Right. So they'll they'll tell USA Archery, hey, you can only have two people to a bail. Right. You can only have X amount of people out here and whatnot. Plus the uh the the travel restrictions or the travel protocols that they're doing are are pretty intense. Yeah. So you gotta take a test three days before you travel, have a negative result, send it in. Okay. Then you can travel. But then you have to get there three days before the tournament to get swabbed. And once you get swabbed clean you're good to go. This is prior to firing an arrow. Correct. So th- they did that, and last week, for the pair of guys, there was a, there was one of the competitors that was good on his on his pre, and when he got there to the tournament and did a swab, it came up positive. So they postponed the men's compound trials. Um, wow. Yeah, but. Luckily, they were able to contact trace and do all that stuff, and there wasn't a lot of close contact to where the majority of the uh, the compound gals were were able to shoot the Gator Cup portion of the of the tournament, but their trials got pushed to uh, SoCal. So yeah, there's a there's a lot of restrictions in place, mainly because one they want to keep everybody clean and safe, right? And two, um, Tokyo, you know the the yeah. IPC committee and the the OPC, they're uh, or sorry, it's the IOC. Um, they have this playbook that that just breaks down all the requirements for Tokyo, um, and what the government in Tokyo wants you to do and what you can do and you can't do. So everybody's got to appease everybody. So right, yeah, um, it's going to be different. It's going to be weird not having a lot of people in the stands for um, a lot of tournaments because there's uh, very limited access as far as for coaches, right. for spectators, for things like that. So It is so weird to see the polar opposite, opposite organizations and how they run. Yeah. Um, like you sat, I guess because it's an Olympic sport, is just, I mean. Yeah, they're, they're kind of handcuffed by the IOC yeah. and USOC. Yeah, it's crazy though. I yeah. mean, because that what you just explained just sounds wow, <laughs> asinine. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, I hate to say I'm trying to be nice. No, but no, my no, God, it's, it's the truth. It's, and and a lot of people are they they have the same feeling, um, but that can't be helping attendance. Correct, yeah. but because they travel not not just around the country, but a lot of those guys, you know, they're on World Cup teams, so they travel to different well, countries. I was going to uh, ask you, how did uh, how did like Paige and those people handle Guatemala? I mean, did you, so, Bridget, I mean, did you hear? Yeah, they, I mean, they were essentially just locked in their hotels. Really? Mm-hmm. Did they have to do a test pre and all that? Do a test post? before? Yeah, some of that. Some of that too is like just the lo- you know the country itself. Right. Like the U.S., you have to have a negative code test before, like before within traveling. three days of reentry. Okay. Right. So, but I don't. Know, Talking to Paige and Linda at Reading the other week, it's, everybody said they were just pretty much just locked in the hotel room. Gotcha. So anyways, yeah, that had to be kind of weird, um, for sure, traveling internationally, doing all these tests before. Because Yeah, well, I mean, there's some guys it's affecting. Cause, so, like, you had asked when we were waiting for him to change a camera battery, Perkins, yeah. he's literally been living at Brandon Ray's house, you know, for the last month or so because he came over for what well, would have been – Either is it Foley first or the Rushmore Rumble? That was the Rushmore yeah, Rumble. I remember that. The, yeah, he went to the Rumble, yeah. went to Foley. And he got stuck in Atlanta forever. I yeah. remember that. And then he went to <laughs> you know, and then we had a little bit of a break between. Yeah. Uh, 
Well, heck, it would have been Rushmore Rumble, and, then Indoor Nationals, yeah. Vegas, Paris, yeah. and Reading. Yeah, because so, it's I think it's a minimum two weeks before Quarant- he can travel. Form- yeah, required quarantine in exactly. Canada. And it's not just that; it's they got to pay out of pocket, mm-hmm. and they got to stay in a hotel and pay out. Oh of yeah, he's stuff. not he's not getting expensed for that. No, it's like two grand every time that they got to do that. Right? Because um, um, I mean, their their prices in Canada. Are well, ridiculous it's funny. Well, we were just talking a second ago about you know Erin McGladder, who's probably one of the top we- women you know, professionals and she's from Canada. Yep. She's just not shooting. Well, I mean, come to one tournament, you got, I mean, it's a damn near a month off work, yeah. all out of pocket that you get a, yeah. you know, a lot of it just changes depending on the country you're in. I know like right. Stefan in Mexico, he doesn't have any issues with that stuff. But right. Canada is a lot more lenient on their, uh, their quarantine and uh, self-isolation or whatever you want to call it. Right. Yeah. But I mean, their borders in, are still entry, closed. Yeah. Their borders are closed. They're they're constantly shutting down. Like Courtney's family, they're shut down right now. I mean, they're they're in lockdown. Well, you know, we had a customer in here yesterday talking about Canada, and I don't know if it's true or not, but they were talking like they have family there. Mm-hmm. That they are actually writing tickets yeah. for people to not have masks on. Well, they're writing tickets. There's cops out there making sure that people aren't crossing borders right. or, or doing it like they can't travel between towns or anything right. like that anymore. Right. So I guess with, with Canada, they, they got that UK variant. Right. And it spread all over the place. I mean, it was wiping, it was wiping out, um, like nursing homes just completely. And, uh, they couldn't find a way to control it. So gotcha. they, they, they minimized their, their, um, exposure i guess at first yeah. and then started locking people down and then they imposed all those quarantine restrictions so that's why a lot of the competitors from canada were like yeah no 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 i mean yeah. there was at the pan am games uh as far as the parasite only karen van ass from canada went down there and the main reason was because she had a really good shot at getting a, a tokyo spot which she did as long uh, along with the the two recurve shooters right. that went down there and the two females got spots for the Olympics. So, you know, so the scary part and weird, the weird part of this whole thing is, for example, she went down and got her spot for Tokyo. Mm -hmm. Theoretically, she could potentially not shoot Tokyo if she breaks one of the protocols or heaven forbid, she happens to just contract COVID from going to Walmart. Yeah. She could possibly not go. Yeah. And even, so it's a risk either way. Even the scary part is, you know, even if you do get sick, Tokyo's not till August for the pair of guys. Right. Uh, July for, for Abel. Um, even if you do get sick now and then you recover and you're non-contagious and stuff you're like not that. Going. But what stops you is, you know, a lot of people keep those um, false positive tests. Right. And if you go and test positive, then you're you're done. You're done. You can't go. So I, I think if I remember right, you had mentioned that you test positive at any time in that window. Yeah. Any time. Well, you can test positive now and they'll keep testing you. Right. Um, and let's say you get to that, that do or die timeline and they say, okay, this is your final test. We're leaving in two, two weeks, weeks or whatever. Yeah. Or, you know, they might take all the athletes and go two weeks prior to departure. We're all going to gather up in Houston and uh, we're all going to have a bubble. Well, if you test positive before that bubble, then you You're might out. not go. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, there's a lot of risk. So I guess a lot of those athletes are going to be in isolation. Yeah. Yeah. Literally. Yeah. Isolation. And I mean, for us, it's not bad. You know, you go shoot a bow by yourself. Um, You can get some of the best training that way or with one or or two other people. Right. But the guys playing team sports. Oh yeah. How does that work? Well, they, they get pulled from their families and now they're in a bubble with their teammates. With their teammates. Yeah. So you're isolated from your family, from the outside world to go, to go compete. And you got to realize or, or make that decision, I guess, how much does it mean or how worth that's it is. That's what I'm saying. That's got to be a crappy way to live. Yeah. I mean, uh, for an extended period of time and you know, what are the games going to look like? You know, that's going to be the weird thing. I mean, if it wasn't for TV endorsements, I don't think the games could function as a, from a financial standpoint. I think that's going to skyrocket though. You really? know, the, the streaming, yeah. uh, NBC's broadcasting and stuff like that. Right. They're having fans, but they're going to be local. 
um, no foreigners are going to be allowed in Japan for the for right. the Olympics. It's all going to be Japanese citizens. Um, but if you look at what it's done to the industry now, all the um, the ASAs are on TV, right? Um, Sportsman Channel or, or whatnot, Cam's covering them. Um, Bo Junkies covering, you know, you have a lot of Facebook lives, a lot of Instagram, YouTube. So at least when there wasn't a lot of fans out in the stands, you were still able to keep up with them. Right. I think it's going to continue, which is probably why archery got so big. Yeah. They started broadcasting and people out there were like, oh, crap, I can go do this. Well, people may or may not know this, but they... For the last two tournaments now, the shoot-offs in ASA have been um, on the Sportsman's Channel. Yeah. I think they were live, weren't they, Bridger? Yeah, so so they're doing, still broadcasting on Cam's Facebook page, the Competitive Archery Media's Facebook page. They're also doing Facebook Live through the Sportsman's Facebook page. Right. And then broadcasting live on Sportsman's Channel. Mm-hmm. Uh, as well during the shootouts. Yeah, it's been kind of weird because we'll, we watch Sports Fresh Channel in the shop, of course, all day. Yeah. And they actually have commercials for archery. Commercial showing it, yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. I don't know, it's I mean, super cool to see. I mean, I don't know if it's the first time that they've had competitive archery on, on national TV. TV, but yeah. I mean, I think it's the first time they've done it live. Yeah. I know we've watched like the, uh, what is it, Buckmasters? The, Buckmasters, the pop-up yeah. Tournament and yeah. A couple other I think ones, IBO, IBO was on a while back, a long time ago. A long time when ago, Levi, yeah. I forget who he shot against and he got beat. It was amazing. It was, oh, that was that was, was an those, ASA, I thought. Was it an ASA? I thought it was an IBO. So you guys, it was indoor. Do you guys yeah. have like a, a referee that comes out and says, pause, commercial break, <laughs> <laughs> TV break, kind of like football games? I think they just make Darren and whoever he's announcing with. Yeah. Halt. Ramble on for 30 seconds. Exactly. That's uh, interesting. No, but it was kind of cool to see Archery on T on network TV for the first time because I, I was of the opinion that they were never putting a foam animal on national TV because of the whole the PETA thing and yeah. you know watching animals get shot. But well, I mean, uh, the channel where all they do is all they do kill exactly animals. exactly be a good spot for that. So it'll be weird to see if it ends up transgressing over into because I, I had heard rumor is there's a lot of talk right now between ESPN and Cam mm-hmm. competition archery. Oh, I guess I haven't heard any of that. Yeah. That'd be pretty sick. Love, dude. If that's that's a game changer. Put her on ESPN. I, I think I think I've seen some archery stuff on uh, is is eleven an ESPN channel? Like I don't ESPN even know what eleven is. or something like that. If know. you look through all the sports channels, yeah, there's one called Eleven, and they always show all the random stuff. It's not. It's it's almost like the Ocho. Um, <laughs> but I mean. On, on eleven, they have the uh, like the simulated football league and stuff mm-hmm. like that, and they've they've actually had some uh, some USATs on there. Yeah, I know so. they've shown like I one time I got like a million texts from a bunch of buddies at home. They showed my World Cup finals match, one of my World Cup final matches on Fox Sports Midwest. Really? Like, yeah, I, like two in the afternoon on a thursday all of a sudden i got like eight text messages eight or ten text messages from buddy like holy shit you're on tv and it was my world cup final match and this was like two years ago i'm like bro this is from like five (laughs) years ago (laughs) yeah (laughs) you did that forever ago yeah that's cool though yeah but yeah so sometimes they show like just random random stuff on there i know they like the world cup they they have a deal with or they had a deal with nbc i think Mm -hmm. NBC or CBS Sports, I don't remember which, but to be able to watch the live broadcast here, you had to have the have the app and a dish or dish service or right. cable provider log in to be able to watch even the World Cups. Right. So, oh, that's wild. Well, hopefully, we're going to see more of that in the future. I think it's uh, I think it's going to be big for the sport for our industry if we do that. Yeah. Um, because it's uh. The, the the number of people getting into target archery is unprecedented. The number, the number of people getting into archery is unprecedented. One of the things that we, at the, at the shop here, um, I actually went out and bought my first handgun, which was a trip. Um, cause I am going back to Montana this year, all cunning. And, uh, it was weird and surreal because I get the gun and there's no ammo. Yeah. <laughs> I mean like, and honestly, now that I've got two boxes of it, I don't want to go shoot it. No. Here's your here's your 
$800 paperweight. Yeah, you exactly. Beat the guy over the head with it instead of actually shooting him. <laughs> right. And yeah. that's what's crazy because I, I actually want to learn. I mean, I am a gun idiot. Mm. I am horrible with a handgun. Um, you didn't even realize how to use iron sights when you, no. we were doing the but shooting prof- proficiency you did pretty test. Good. Well, I actually shot good. Yeah. I, don't, I'm, I can shoot, but like Bridger and everybody there was laughing at me because I don't know how to work one. Ah. You know, and I'm probably... Yeah, it was bad <laughs> because I, I think I had to have one of the instructors, Brian Wisniewski, one of our staff shooters had taught that concealed carry class and it was him or I forget who was standing next to me, but somebody had to come over to help me with the slide and how to rack one and all that crazy stuff. You know, you see it on TV. It looks so easy. Man, when you're out there and you're, I'm sweating bullets because I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I'm going to screw this up in front of shoot, all my I'm cohorts. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I actually need to train, but I don't. And which brings me to my point. Um, we have gotten more people in the last probably 90 days. The common theme is I like to shoot things and I can't get bullets for my gun. Yeah. So I want a bow. And they can go get their bullet. You know, I always say you get your bullets back unless you sink at archery. Ammo. Yeah, 100%. And we have seen an influx of people in this industry move over from the gun world because they just can't get anything. You know, Philip Hall, one of my uh, co-owners here and good friends is into shotgun sports. Mm -hmm. And I used to shoot really hyper competitive shotgun sports and we were talking about going and, but go try to find shotgun shells. No, when you find them. Shells. Yeah. You can find them now. They're coming out. Yeah. But that, that box of bird shot that used to cost you, I don't know, like three or four dollars. Yeah. yeah. That's about $15 now. Okay. It's funny you say that. He just ordered some from Midway USA that came in here the other day and the Remington gun clubs. So that was our cheap shell. You could buy at Walmart for three or $4. Or if you go to any gun club, you can get them for three or four bucks. Yeah. $10 a box. Yep. And that is the cheap stuff. Yeah. I would hate to see how much a Winchester double A cost right now. Low brass and yeah. all that. The, it's not even brass. You're, it's, you're, coated metal yeah you're eight year shot and there's shaped like squares instead <laughs> yeah, of bb exactly no i was in shock um, it's just it's gone out of control i mean you you look at the basic things and i i base it all off like 22 yeah you know rim fire you, right you buy that about as much of uh you pay for a, a box of 50 kind of like buying a box of pellets yeah so it was like two dollars and 25 cents for a box of 50 yeah that box of 50 now is like nine or ten bucks so someone told me when I bought the nine millimeter stuff that, that I had gotten, um, they were talking that it was used to be 18 cents around. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You're looking at it's a dollar right now cents to, to a dollar. I could not believe that. Now for me, the pricing seemed okay. I mean, I, cause I don't know any better. Yeah. No. But at 18 cents. Oh dude, we used to. So when I worked at Shields in Des Moines, we'd sell a 500 count box for, I mean, it'd be 50 bucks. Yeah. Really? 500 rounds for 50 bucks. For, yeah, for an ammo. And it, that came with like plastic ammo can. I, I mean, it's paid, like yeah. cheap. So that's remember, cheap ammunition. You remember FMJ, when, you're, but. when your parents, when you're growing up and they're like, yeah, you know, back in the day, I used to pay a nickel for oh, a yeah. soda. Yeah, yeah. That's going to be us talking to, to talking about about kids. About talking about guns. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, hey, you crazy. just go to the store whenever you wanted to go shoot your gun. You just go in and buy it. Exactly. Yeah. No, not exactly. Anymore. No, so, not anymore. It's it's changing, yeah. It's changing drastically, and I think that's gonna that's gonna make archery even more and more and more available to people because they're not gonna want to spend that money. Well, you know, it's funny you say that. Also, the big thing that we've seen, and this is all everything I think right now is a derivative of COVID. Mm-hmm. Um, you probably have, and I talked to a couple of parents, and actually, I had a lady in here the other day who was an ex public school teacher, and uh, they she's got like 15 or 20 students now. She teaches privately. Yeah. Makes literally, she said three times the amount of money she made as a public school teacher and having better success with those students. Mm-hmm. It's kind of weird because Monday through Thursdays from eight to 1230, that's their day. Yeah. One 10 minute break and they're done. And they've got, she was talking about, she's got two kids that were I think freshmen and they were C students. Uh, one of them's going to Baylor now. Both will graduate with an associate's degree as seniors. Um, they're that far ahead and it's just, you know, we had a long discussion about how broken our entire school system is, mm-hmm. you know, as a, from a public standpoint. And, um, but what that's done for archery is we've had so many kids come in that are now being homeschooled or they're on the, uh, a lot of places are giving you the option to do online schooling instead of going to school. 
And in doing so, you know, your day is now three to four hours. Well, you got these kids now that are typically in school for eight hours. They got four to five hours a day. Extra. Extra yeah. downtime. And parents don't want them spending that on their phone. Correct. You know, or on their Xbox. And they're bringing them in here to shoot bows yeah. and archery because it's a somewhat sa- a much safer sport than going to get a shotgun or a, a handgun. And yeah. Heck of a lot cheaper. And, and what it's done is actually... And it, I don't know. I, and I don't know this, but I'm assuming that your mainstream sports like baseball, football, basketball, you know, that are high, uh, school funded mm-hmm. have got to be taking a hit, you know, because the kids may or may not be there to participate. Yeah. Um, well, and all the restrictions you have with the restrictions. Any, yeah. Any, like, any team sport right now, you know, that kids or parents may not want to deal with. And, yeah. Yeah, oh. well, one kid gets sick and the entire tournament shut down for the whole weekend, you know, mm-hmm. and I've heard of, we've got a couple of our customers, they're, they're into that competitive volleyball. Well, I'll never forget Keith. I think it was Keith Mott or Josh Abel, but one of them they had driven all the way somewhere up north to play in this volleyball tournament. And then either somebody got COVID or something happened, but the, the hosting venue didn't realize how big the tournament was or whatever and freaked out and literally shut it down before it started. <laughs> And then they, as an organization, had taken upon themselves to try to find alternate venues throughout this city to try to play this tournament over the weekend. And he said it was, oh, he said it was was unbelievable, you know, but that's the world we live in now. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. So individual sports are on the rise. Yeah. Um, And for us, I mean, we're in one of the the major individual sports. Yeah. So. Without a doubt everybody's going to go out and buy a bow and then it's going to be even harder to buy arrows and yeah, we're going to be the same, same situation as the gun industry. Oh yeah. But without a doubt, yeah, we'll be fine. We'll be fine. So what's, what's next for you, Bridger? Uh, God, I don't even know. Uh, London. Yeah. London hey, ASA. Why don't you talk real quick through your last three week schedule? <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> that, that last say. three weeks we had, so the NFA rescheduled, <laughs> Champion championship only for Vegas. So for they Vegas, did the yeah. amateur flight division stuff. They so did how all, was that? Because we haven't had a chance to actually debrief on that. How it was, was that tournament? I mean, it felt I mean, it felt like Vegas. It was weird because there wasn't like a huge contingent archery people at the right. casino, right? Which was nice because you know it didn't take you twenty minutes to get up the damn elevator, right? Get to your room after you're done shooting. Because normally, like that little back hallway that cuts across the, oh yeah, like it's normally that whole hallway is you know, the line to get onto the elevator. So that wasn't there. But, and then we, instead of shooting the arena, we shot in just the normal halls where the, halls, the flight yeah. division normally I shoots. I noticed that. So you guys so did it was a shoot. Little, it was in, a little different. Yeah. Um, but. So you weren't in that big arena? No, we weren't year. in the arena What did they do with that arena? Just shut it down? for? I don't know. I didn't, don't know. They had it closed off. I didn't even go in there. I didn't, see, I think they had the trade show in there. I didn't go in and look gotcha. around at all. Gotcha. So, cause I was, my mom came along, so we were hanging out and doing stuff. So I ended up not walking through the trade show or anything. But, yeah, it was in just the regular halls where, where normally the amateur shoot there at South Point. How many competitors do you think were there, roughly? They had right around 800. 800? Uh, no, maybe not. Maybe a little less than that. I'm actually not 100% sure. Yeah. I know they were going to cap it at 800. Gotcha. And I signed up, like, the last day of pre-registration before the the late fee so right. i don't know that they hit that number or not but i mean it i mean you went to vegas yeah kind of in the height of it and it was the same type of oh, same yeah. type of stuff now you didn't have to have like a reservation to go eat anywhere or anything like that That's you good. could show up and eat but like the second you went behind the the little curtains where the shooters area is you had to have a mask on and really all that stuff yeah and wow. and that's all that was all the nevada sports that was it, exactly for them to be able to do it. And that's why they were policing it so hard so that the casino didn't get, didn't get pegged with a bunch of fines and stuff. Right. So, I mean, that side of it, I get, I guess, but, uh, we had that one. And then right after that, I, cause I flew out there on Tuesday cause we shot instead of shooting Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we shot Thursday, Friday, Saturday, flew out on Tuesday, back on Sunday, then Wednesday drove up to Paris. Yeah. For the ASA up there. The ASA, yeah. Got poured on on Friday afternoon. <laughs> right. And still don't understand why all the pros have to shoot at 730 to give the ASA four, four to six hours to figure out who's going to shoot off. Yeah. Whatever. Right. So 
shot that one. And then last week was in Reading. Well, that's what I was say. So you came back on Sunday. Yeah. Shot Tuesday or shot in, or for Paris. Shot Saturday. Went, came back Sunday. I think we drove, I might've driven back Saturday afternoon into Sunday. And then that, you know, last Wednesday flew out early in the morning to go to Redding, California for the trail it, shoot. It was hilarious because Courtney was talking about he didn't have any laundry. Like you were running out of clothes. Oh, dude, I, I lived the last three weeks out of my suitcase. Exactly. Like I didn't even, like I went from my suitcase into my, basically into the washing machine and yeah. from the washing machine to the dryer to back the into the suitcase. Yeah. Like I didn't even bother. Well, I think what was it, away. Tuesday night? What? You were up till how long doing laundry? Oh yeah, it's up till yeah <laughs> Tuesday night before flying out to Reading. I'm up till like two a.m. Yeah, doing laundry. doing laundry yeah. and the same thing. Like literally pulling crap out of the dryer. Yeah, and like pull it rolled up, throw it in my suitcase. The life of a tournament, a touring archery pro. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I, dude, I fell for you, bro, because you were like on pins and needles for three weeks. Yeah, it was crazy. It was busy three Matter of fact, well, well, probably in your career. To have them, because uh, those, those I mean, are not three the major events, though. Yeah, those are I mean, three not the busiest events. three weeks I've ever had, but pretty close. I mean, having that those three back to back, yeah. So, and those I are mean, actually all three completely independent. They're all disciplines. yeah, totally different setups. You so got, had, you got Vegas, with, Vegas with the twenty seven series, and then you go to ASA, we're probably with a what twenty three, twenty five, twenty fives, and then you go to outdoor shooting, Reading and Reading shooting pro tours shooting with total all, heads. all of them different, yeah. different site setups. So that's the scopes. other thing people don't realize: he's coming back after every one of those events and getting what in twenty four hours setting up a completely new bow. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. I shot the same bow the whole same time, bow, but different setup, but having to retune everything and all that make stuff. new marks built. Yeah. Build all new tapes. Yeah. <laughs> At least in Vegas, I didn't need a tape. So that one yeah, was easy. It's 20 yards. Yeah. But yeah, having to do tapes for, for 3d and then a tape for my pro tours for Reading. That's crazy. And make sure everything's tuned right. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I talked to him last week when he got back from uh, Reading and I, and I asked him, I said, are you, are you sick of archery? <laughs> I mean, my Your case is still in the case. My bow's still in the case. <laughs> I haven't touched it. All right. It's still sitting in the range. I'm yeah. probably going to do it here in the next couple of days, trying to get it set back up for, cause what we're London, but right. I'll have another big three week, three or four week ordeal for the, cause they, we got in July, we have the national roundup. And then the weekend after that is OPA. And then the weekend after that is Coleman. Right. So, oh, geez. yeah, at I least mean, that one, I could shoot the same arrow, yeah. pretty much the same setup for NFA and the OPA. Exactly. Okay. So that won't be that bad. So you're going to OPA with big arrows? Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, actually, just to recap, once you talk through, I know you talked through Vegas, you, you shot decent at Vegas, but probably I shot, not where you wanted to be. Yeah. Well, and a lot of that, I just didn't put enough time into it. Yeah. I've been over 3D or over Indoor, indoor for a little bit right like i didn't even retune the bow for it i refletched all my arrows and feathers so that i didn't have to worry about my fletching clearance <laughs> i mean that's i was so <laughs> unworried about it yeah i mean so, it's, it's gonna be tough i mean a lot of pros probably are over it it seems like you everything was overlapping yeah i mean i mean it's definitely one of the later years for indoor yeah I mean, well you know it's weird and that's what i've always thought this that and this is why I think archery suffers at some level, some degree, because none of the organizations play well in the sandbox. Mm -hmm. You would think that the heads of ASA, NFAA, and USAT would at least get on a, a, a symbiotic level of communication to say, yeah, I mean, hey, we'll think about doing this here, but honestly, they just don't care. They just, they I don't just know if schedule. it's that. I mean, some of it's who gets their schedule out first, Yeah, but I... For the most part, they do a decent, decent job at it because nobody wants all their, you know, main competitors to be at another tournament. Right. You no, know, to not be able time. to get as much, gotcha. get as many people there between a amateurs, you know, because they're funding the tournaments yeah. really, really yeah. and pros so that they have some promotional material and stuff. Yeah. But, um, hey, real quick, let's, let's circle back to Vegas real quick. So did, did you, did you happen to look at the amateur scores that was on the virtual side? It was pretty funny. Hey, doggy. <laughs> people shoot a lot better in their basement, man. You ain't lying, dude. I think there were more three or perfect 900 shot this year than like ever. ever in history with the amateur side. So for those of you who don't know, 
Vegas did the amateur side as a virtual tournament over about a six or eight week period. I think it was. Um, I think it was all of March and all of April. Yeah, all of March, all of April. And you could shoot it pretty much anywhere. I mean, it was. You could shoot it indoors, outdoors. Anywhere. Anywhere. Oh, yeah, pretty much. Um, heck, it was so it was so crazy. You could have shot a, let's say you hypothetically, you, as a shop, you had a Vegas league and you shot for three straight weeks, three 30 round scores, scoring ends for your league. Mm -hmm. You could convert those into Vegas scores, which I, for me was shocking. I, I and I called it, I said, there's going to be more 900 shot this year than ever in history. Well, if you could look at the history, but to Bridger's point, you're going to shoot better on your home court for sure. I mean, then getting in front of this big venue that you've got, you know, thousands of people on the line. You don't have any pressure. No, no, no. I heck, our archers will tell you that. I mean, they, they, they loved it. It was simple. It was easy. I didn't you know? do it. I, no, I didn't I either. Skipped out of it. I, I did the indoor World Series that they did, the virtual part. I think I shot the first or second of those, but I was shooting them at home. Yeah. So you know, we set up a target set it up at 20 yards outside except that it was during the winter and yeah. yeah we live in texas and it doesn't get cold but when you're so used to hot weather and then you get a little bit of a chill and it's chilly yeah it, especially it, in your garage it, yeah i mean or outside, Practicing wherever, outside. Yeah. yeah exactly so didn't do that didn't do the vegas one but hopefully vegas will go back to normal next year yeah i think it will you think it will I, yeah I think it has the to. NFA, the yes. NFA doesn't want to lose out, lose out on all that. Dough. No, no. Plus the international big uh, money. Maker well, there were, were there any international shooters at Vegas? Mm -hmm. Were there? Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. I didn't know if they're because like I shot with a dude from like El Salvador and uh, there was a couple. There was a couple international not, not guys. Not as big as typical. Not as but, many as normal. Right. Yeah. Gotcha. But there were. I mean, there were some people that like couldn't come. I know Mike. Slosher, he wasn't there because he got into. I think he said he ended up getting a co positive COVID test in Mexico, wasn't it? He's in Mexico or might have gone to Guatemala yeah. early or something, but he ended up getting a positive test, so he couldn't leave wherever he was to come to Vegas before the yeah. World Cup down there. And, and probably, <laughs> hey, and, and he, probably he, thank he shot, goodness because he's on fire right now. He shot he's good there. Amazing. He got silver, dude. He went to Guatemala and just lit it up. He, he was, shot pretty good, yeah. He was what one point away from breaking Braden's record. Yeah. Oh, did he? Yeah, he, he shot, shot a like a seventeen. Yeah, yeah, yeah he from did. From tying the record, yeah. Yeah, he shot, and it is so yeah. Thank goodness he didn't come to Vegas. We talked about ASA and then Reading. You just got back from Reading last week. Um, that had to be a little different because that was a limited field, also. Yeah, so they capped it at like eight hundred people, and, and there normally, were some big pros that didn't make it. I know. Yeah, like. A lot of a lot of big guys weren't there. So, I think I was the only dude wearing a blue and blue and white shirt. Really? Yeah. I think I was the only elite bro there. <laughs> really? Yeah. Yeah, because I had heard. Uh, I, I know you had registered early. Thank goodness. Because well, you you get had just gotten off the phone with I, another or like a guy that owns a I, shop yeah. out west there that shoots that tournament. I was talking. About, so I'll take credit. The reason Bridger was there is because of me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because I literally hung up. And I said, bro, you better get online because they're talking about ready. It's going to fill up in less than two days. And mm -hmm. this was like two hours after they opened registration. Exactly. They opened it at like noon yeah. on whatever day it was. And this was at like two or two thirty. Yeah. So most pros, people don't realize this, but a, a tournament like Reading, all the manufacturers will get slots given to them, if I'm not mistaken. Where yeah, but that's just for the manufacturer sheet. Yeah. So but, they, they, but they, you have, so Reading has championship bail. So you have to like every five targets is a championship target. Right. And you can only sign up for that if you're shooting the championship division. So gotcha. not that we have like reserved spots. Right. But it's yeah, so a sign up at the booth in Vegas and, you know, they like, they'll still have some spots left. They're not quite yeah. full. They're probably at that point, like halfway or 75% full. Right. Sometimes a little bit more, but like this year, like you said, it was like two hours after I registered and I literally just, I just picked any given target that was open. There was only like two targets that were yeah. still open. Now I got shuffled around a whole bunch because I changed teammates a bunch of times. Right. Cause I was supposed to shoot with Blake and then he ended up not going. Right. Cause the elite wasn't taking a the trailer there. And then yeah, <laughs> I was shoot, supposed to shoot with Paige. Right. And then she had somebody else that had signed up as her partner already. Right. And then I lucked out and got Domi the, 
Well, Uden, the guy that won it the year before, year prior. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. you guys and won we, the team shoot. Yeah, so we, we were the only team that cleaned it. Yeah, um, that's cool. He tied for first with Chris and then lost in a shoot off. And I mean, both of them will say it. Neither neither of them shot a very great shoot off arrow, but it was pretty close. Yeah, but what did he end up losing by? Like half an inch, quarter I don't know, inch, probably you don't an, know. Inch, an inch or two. I was just curious. They're both low. Yeah, but and then but, so this year was probably the first year and you shot it numerous times. There was really little wait times. Oh, dude, normally like a good day before, like we'd be done at three or three thirty. Right. On uh Saturday, second day of shooting, we were done by twelve fifteen. Yeah, that's wow. a two and, and, and a half hour. Absolutely obliterated. Like I mean never stopped, never waited right. for a single spot. Now we shot the lower fourteen and a a little bit of the canyon, so it was a shorter section of the course and a lot, right. you know, less chance of backups there. But even the first day when we had, uh, you know, we shot all the long stuff on the first day between Bigfoot, Elk Herd, the Moose, uh, a couple other long targets. Even there, we had no weight. Yeah. Like I barely had time to stuff a hamburger down my, down my throat <laughs> waiting for Bigfoot. Yeah. And typically that's typically, yeah, yeah. Typically you get like 30 minutes to an hour, right. Just a Bigfoot. And then, no, the elk herd's the same way. The canyon bears the same way. Now the third day, because of the wind, was a lot, a little bit longer. Right. Even though it was less targets, just because guys were taking a little more time with the wind. But, right. But still, you guys were moving along pretty quick. Oh yeah, it was yeah. a pretty good clip. Not so. like typical. It's amazing when you take all those amateurs out, or most of them out, and you saw all the championship guys, pros, and and. Well, um, I mean, it was about still about the same mix. Of amateurs was it really and pros? But there was just less people overall. Yeah. Well, what's what do they typically run? They normally Attendance. have about fifteen hundred, and this time eight hundred. They cap it, and they, yeah. this year they kept it at like eight or eight fifty something yeah. like that. So half the field. Mm -hmm. That's Pretty awesome. Much. Yeah. So that's just, that's been part part of the weird thing this year, of course, is you know field capping by some of the organizations and yeah. um, tournaments, of course, going by much quicker than normal. Uh, that's and that's not a bad thing because I tell you, them tournaments can be a grind. And that's why I got, well, we were joking earlier. I mean, he's he hasn't taken a bow out of the case yet because that's three weeks of living heck. <laughs> Nonstop shooting. Yeah. Yeah. Plus the constant setup and tuning and yeah. marks. and. I mean, like, I didn't have any issues with my marks. I, yeah, I never you were changed, lucky on that. I never changed my... T this is, like, the, maybe, like, the first or second year ever where I've gone there and not had to change my tape. Normally, oh, so I have, like, a whole book of tapes. Right. But I'm also normally at home, you know, with my parents and it's 40 degrees out and I'm trying to get a site tape. Yeah. Whereas here, the weather here is about the same as it is there. Exactly. And everything. So I'm not having to do as many changes with that. Right. And you guys had great weather up in uh, Reading this year. Yeah. Other than Sunday and all, all that really was just wind. It was yeah. still pretty nice out. Right. Gosh. So, so you're next up on your plates, what, London, Kentucky? London ASA. for the Pro-Am. And then... Metropolis. That's at the beginning of June. The end of June is Metropolis. And then July. Out, and you have outdoor nationals mixed in there somewhere. The NFA. NFA. Yeah. So they're doing the roundup again, but that's not till July. So that's like the right in the middle of July. Is that gotcha. up in Yankton? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. So they'll have field nationals, outdoor target nationals, and the first Dakota classic. Yeah, you need to, you need to get on board with that one, Jay Bird. I might go give it a try. Yeah. You could definitely shoot the their that field course. Yeah, I know. I know. Rooster went out there. Yeah, you Kevin can shoot Mather that field out there. course without any issues, yeah. especially if you have track chair. Yeah, yeah. I might bring that little four wheel drive one. That one was perfect. It. Yeah, there's that like little chairs. There's cool. like one course and one specific target that you might have trouble on. It's a little fifteen yarder, but I think even that you could probably shoot it. I'll just shoot it from twenty. Yeah, go back farther. That's <laughs> Yeah, definitely. So, no, that, that really piques my interest because I found something out on Tuesday. What's that? You put a peep and a scope on a bow? That's <laughs> that is cheap. way easier. <laughs> that is way easier. Yeah, Jason came into our, our Vegas League format on Tuesday for the first time. Gosh, I think it forever with a peep, which was wild. Yeah. Um, well, it was the first time I, I dude, picked up a bow in four weeks. you made it to the finals? or Yeah. yeah. I lost to Kenna in a, like a double... Or triple to, shoot, shoot, shoot off. off. Yeah. Um, and that was pure fatigue. Yeah. So 
normally I shoot that 45 pound bow. Right. Um, I was not ready for 60, a 60 pound bow <laughs> on spirals. And no. I mean, it's not even at 60. I, I think I had it like 58 and wound up taking two turns out of it. So it's, yeah. I went into home and I, I checked it. It's right at like 55 and a half, 56. Um, yeah, my body was not ready for no. it. But I, I love Hoyt because you go to the ATA show or you go to these, you know, to like the Paris Pro-Am and I had a lot of guys go up there and, oh, I, I want to get spiral cams, man. They're awesome. They felt so good. And I'm like, okay, time out. You shot it at 50 pounds. That's a different animal at 60 and it is an absolute dinosaur mm. at 70. Um, one of our guys, Clayton, he wants to get a 70 pound spiral cam. And I'm like, bro. And coming out of an elite. Oh, yeah. There's no, no way. I told him, I says, you can try it. Uh, you, you'll hate it. And he's a big boy, he's so he'd probably be fine. But it's coming still, from that result, no. that's a very <laughs> vanilla game compared exactly, to a Exactly, yeah. Yeah, but it's going to take it's gonna take some work and some, oh, some yeah. time. It just, no, but that's interesting. I'm, I'm going to put that in my books. Yeah. It's it's that whole three-discipline thing in, in one tournament. It's good walleye time, too. Ooh. Yeah. Is that another bait fish? No, are you no? Now you're cussing. That's hey, like probably Bridger's, walleye is Bridger's face. I'm glad <laughs> we're on camera because you guys are going to be able to see Bridger's face when I yo, said that. What? It Undoubt- just one of, undoubtedly the best fresh or best tasting freshwater fish. On I agree, plane. thousand yeah. percent. Maybe maybe best fish overall ever. It's nah. close. Oh, it's close. Halibuts. I think the only thing that might be better. No, I'm. I don't know. I it, I grew it, up it, on saltwater, so I'm biased. Yeah, I mean, but it, I here's like the thing. Saltwater, fish, saltwater is good. It's, it doesn't, it's a different fish. Yeah. It's just different. Walleye doesn't taste like fish. It doesn't. It's weird. It's just, there's no fish. Because it? <sighs> it tastes so good. The texture? No. It's flaky, for sure. Walleye's. Walleye's. Yeah. It's, it's, it's amazing. Stuff. I mean, I'll, I'll give it a whirl. I'm oh, good. You've, you've, never, eat, you, you've never had it? No, I'll eat anything, so. Oh. You gotta get so it. I'm, I'm trying to convince Rod to bring his boat. Yeah, through. he's got so he's got like a big old freaking cruise liner. He's got a really? giant boat. Yeah, yeah. If we went up to that lake up there at Yankton and caught some walleyes and grilled them, mm-hmm. yeah, you'd be done. You Stuff's grilling amazing. them for you. Just fry them. Fry them. Little fry we mat. chop them up. We chop them up and make little nuggets. Yeah, make yeah. little nuggets. Fry them with house puppies. It's it's amazing. Fry, fry magic. Yeah, it's amazing. Amazing. Yeah, but it was funny the the fishing part of it is like got me out of archery a little bit right now because fishing fish are biting. Yeah, like when's crazy. the last time you oh, picked up a bow? Dude, it's been a while. You and your green carp. Yeah, I know. But man, we're killing them right now. I've been like with archery people though. It's funny. All, everybody I'm going with are archers, that, but we're, they have boats that so feed the addiction. And yeah, I'll tell you what, it's, it's been epic. Yeah, and your epic your social media is no longer archery. It's I fishing. know it's been all bass fishing the last, last month, <laughs> month and a half. Hey. I need to start shooting again. It's 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 a good it's a good way to clear the mind. It is, and I was shooting so bad this spring that I kind of yeah I needed to. You break. haven't shot since that one ASA qualifier. Have you? Yeah, that one was bad. Yeah, we won't talk about that. No, it was it's bad. crazy that you struggle to shoot when you set a set your bow up at ten at ten o'clock at night the night before. It, 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 you know, people always say that, but they don't realize I've been doing this so long. I should be able to adequately go and shoot a respectable score even doing that and I don't and I get really angry and I mean I would yeah. consider up with three hours into a bow like adequate no not when you go through a course like in your 20 sum up and then in 10 targets you end up eight up that's horrible shooting literally eight up yeah literally 308 oh no, that's unacceptable in my book and it has nothing to do with your setup or time behind the bow it's just absolute you suckness That's so yeah new one. yeah <laughs> you I, suckness you suckness going on a shirt exactly <laughs> so anyways no and it's but the fishing has been great this spring and yeah. it's been a great break away from the archery world for sure but I'm surprised you're not bow fishing you know it's funny we were going to take one up there for like three trips in a row jesse yeah. one of our guys forgot it one day and i am not kidding you there were 30 and 40 pound beluga carp up there five feet from the boat. And every time it happened, I'd be like, wow, it'd be awesome if we had a bow right now. I was just giving him crap because he forgot it. And I mean, it, so there were so many in this one cove we went into, there was like, they were spawning, I think, and they mm-hmm. were doing their rolling up 
above the water. Mm -hmm. And uh, I took um, a treble hook and tied it onto a weight. We used to do this all the time when we were fishing back on the tour. We get bored. And I snagged one. And I'm not kidding you. That sucker, I couldn't stop it. It just, I hit it. He took off and was just schooling me and took me and dropped me off on a, on a big rock pile and don't know what happened. It was really? an absolute massive carp. I figure him at 30, 30 plus. Yeah, a lot of fun though. It was a so heck all of these, a lot of fun. All these carp in the lake though, they're invasive. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. They're nasty. You know, but you know, you, we were talking about this last weekend. You know, there are other parts of the world that carp is a delicacy. Yeah. Dude, my, I so that. I had a guy that I used to shoot with when I was a kid is, Neighbors were from Vietnam and they would smoke carp all the time. Yeah. And it was, it's some of the best fish I've Did ever Did you had. have it? It's better than walleye. Well, it's a different animal. Yeah. But I mean, like as far as smoked fish goes, it was pretty damn good. So like, I, it was one of the better smoked fish I've ever had. And I heard that you, it's just the way you prepare them, I think, from cleaning. Yeah. You got to take the mud vein out and you pull it. Yeah. Pull bony. the red line out and then you got to pull a bunch of pin bones. Yeah. I, I would think it's the same with like freshwater catfish. You know, one thing we used to do when I lived in Georgia is we would take the the catfish, put it in a bathtub with clean water. Yeah, you gotta let them. it let it filter out that mud out. Yeah, and it would taste so much better. Yeah, um, it's my a guy that I hunt with at home, Jesse. He literally made a a water tank in his backyard that had uh had the O2 unit and everything on it just for cat for catfish. Really mudding. Mm -hmm. That's wild. And it had a filtration system, so it was new water all the time. Yeah, and yeah. Clean them up. It, he uses it. Well, he uses it to keep bluegill alive, or, <laughs> as you goofy Texans call them, perch. Perch. Yeah. Disrespecting the name of the perch there. Yeah. But he'd put he put bluegill in there. Yeah. Or for bay, he'd go and catch him out of the pond behind his house <laughs> and throw him in there. Throw okay, the little ones in there for bay. That's next level then, stuff right there. <laughs> and then throw catfish in it afterwards. Oh wow. After they caught a bunch that's of doing bank rolls. Yeah. That's so crazy. Yeah, it's yeah, going to be interesting to see all this stuff once while, I get to travel again. Yeah, while yeah. we're on the topic of fish, Texans, why do you why do you call bluegill perch? Oh, I don't. I, they're bluegills to me. Bluegills. Yeah. Perch. Perch, the perch is like second place next to, next to a walleye. The true perch from up north, a yes. Yellow, a yellow to perch. Eat is yeah. amazing. I'll, you guys I'll agree with that. I've had yellow perch before. Disrespect in the name. And they those suckers get what pound get, pound and a half. You get the jumbo perch. Yeah, you catch jumbo jumbo perch through the ice. You'll catch you know pound and a half. To yeah, half those they get pretty big, and they're, they're so the good. Size of a football. Yeah. Mm. Well, it's kind of like the whole thing we were talking about this weekend fishing again. About you know you go to Alabama, Georgia, the south southeast. It's called they're called crappy, and we call them crappies. You know, I mean, I call them crappies to. Do you really? Well, like as a joke. Oh, yeah. They are kind of crap. <laughs> no, they're not. They're amazing to eat. Um, we'll go back onto archery a little bit. So real quick, we'll probably need to wrap up a little bit in a, in a bit. But um, just talk about maybe the, some of the bows that came out this year. Um, this has been a, a, pre, a big year of change for a lot of manufacturers. Mm -hmm. um, we carry five, and I've, I've, we've worked on all of them, but... Um, the majority of the manufacturer made some pretty big changes this year. Um, White came out with Hoyt. an elite cam. With the <laughs> it came out yeah. with a binary. Yeah, which binary was a, that needed to happen. Yeah. Um, it has been a big hit. I think the bow is a heck of a lot better this it year. It's so much easier to tune a bow instead of having to sit there and yoke tune it. Yeah. Well, yes and no. We got to shim it this year. They actually sell. A shim. We have a we. They gave us two shim kits with it, mm -hmm. um, which is still easy. It's not that hard. Um, and, but they're coming up pretty simple to tune. Um, but it, it, just the entire cam system alone is just easier. I really enjoy it. Yeah. On that, that new RX five. Yeah. I really, really, really like it. Um, and then elite, uh, I think they did the, one of the best jobs this year. Um, at that on course, I'll give them some love. They're on course. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, it's, we carry Elite, Prime, Hoyt, PSC, and Darton, and that is the fastest bow we carry, the Encore. Um, it is amazing, uh, for sure. We um, we really like that bow. And then, uh, you know, Prime didn't do a lot of mega changes. They have a, a new handle, new grip that I like. The grip actually feels really good. And they actually changed the cam where it's softer this year. You don't get that back mm -hmm. wall thud that you that they're so historically known for. 
And the bow is actually quieter, heck of a lot quieter than it has been. They, I don't know how they did it, but they got rid of a lot, a lot of that that tuning fork sound yeah. mm-hmm. that they're notorious they're known for. And then I think PSE, from my from my standpoint, built probably one of the the sleeper bows of the year. That EVL bow is unbelievable. It's easy to shoot. Yeah, very easy to shoot. Easy to shoot. Um, just absolutely rave about that bow. I I got a chance to shoot it in Foley this year and shot it. Uh, it kind of sucked my elite cam went wonky on me actually you you found it jason thank goodness a little bearing and that's coming out on tech tips <laughs> season <yeah>. two <laughs> but yeah and it was weird that evl 34 came in the day that it happened and mm-hmm. the, the specs are almost the same as my my ritual 35 yeah and i put it together and gosh i was i think i was in seventh or ninth place after day one in paris and i mean in Foley, mm-hmm. and just that bow just wouldn't miss uh i know i think i won I won or got second in my age division on the GPO course with it. I busted like seven twelves with that sucker, and it just it just wouldn't it wouldn't get out of the middle. Yeah, um, you know, day two happens it, like always. Uh, I'd put probably ten arrows through the bow before I left, and some cables started to go a little wonky on me. I was adding four and a half five yards by the end of the tournament on day two, but still no complaints in the bow. That's just a, a nature of the beast, and not being able to shoot it enough to break it in and. Mm-hmm. But man, it shot good. God, that bow's amazing. Really liked the the PSC this year. And then real quick, we'll talk about Darton. You know, we picked up Darton this year, which was um, probably a risk. You know, I don't, people that don't know, Randy Kitts, the owner of Black Eagle and Conquest Stabilizers, bought Darton Archery this year, which yeah. was a big deal. Um, and I think he's going to do some pretty big things. I've been talking with him about what they're going to change on their bows this year. And uh I think they're going to be a player. Everything that Randy touches in this industry turns into gold. And uh, and Jimmy Lutz is shooting that bow right now, right, Bridge? Yeah. And shooting it. I saw really a handful well. of guys shooting them in Fol- or in uh, uh, Redding. Really? Yeah. This past week, too. Yeah. yeah. I know I know Jimmy went to, I think it was Arizona. And he did okay. He, got, yeah, he put he up a 707 with it. Got good there. He did, I don't know how he shot at the World Cup, but. He's been, I know he's still at the top of his game. I think yeah. he's, he's, he's still, still down a little bit. Cause I think he just got, or he's getting married. So he didn't. Oh, he is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know that. He's, Denel, he's yeah. punching his way across the, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> across the circuit. He's still shooting pretty good though. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. So yeah. Anyways, the manufacturers have come out with some good stuff and I, and it's, you know, once again, we've talked about this in the past and mentioned it, but yeah, if you don't get into your bow shop to get a bow this summer um there might not be bows to get after that for a while for a while you're going to be you're going to be scraping last year and maybe yeah. some of the remainders of the year prior to that yeah um so if you, I, i've been telling everybody it may not be the right color but if it's the right specs and you want it you better get it yeah um because like right now i'll give you an example if a guy comes in and wants a hoyt bow to use for elk season it's not happening mm-hmm. he's not going to get it uh, and so you got to look at that when you're making a choice and a decision because that's, and I, was, I don't think it's going to get better. You're talking about if they want a custom bow or yeah. something like that. Yeah. yeah. Or color that the shop doesn't have and they've got every color, but they're missing a, a black one. Yeah. You might have to just go with, you know, luckily we were able to salvage something right before mm-hmm. Mexico Yeah, where you call and get something off their this manufacturer off the shelf. list. Yeah. And we, it may not have been the color you wanted. I, I don't think it was, but at the yeah. end of the day, we got the bow. Yep. Um, and that's so. what you, I think some of these guys are going to be stuck in that position this year. It's going to be tough because they're, it's unprecedented demand that is yeah. out there in this industry. I'll tell you, like I, I called Excel the other day about an achieved target site. Oh, they're, they're, they're that ain't happening, up. doggy. <laughs> you ain't getting it. <laughs> I mean, no, cause what they're, what they're building is going out to Lancaster. Yeah. And what Lancaster has, it's already pre-sold. Exactly. Heck, so, we're like, every shop's doing it. You were literally going through Lancaster, Kinsey's, Papes. Mm-hmm. I mean, you you name it. If you're a distributor, you are, you're just surfing through it. I'll take that. Put it on order now. Yep. You know, and even if it's showing out of stock, if they've got a delivery date that's somewhat okay. Like I've, we actually, I ordered Keith and Achieve um, last month. It's a black and silver one. It's sitting in there. That thing's worth a fortune right now. Oh yeah, <laughs> I, I thought about posting it online. It's, it's, yeah, it's I, I'm not the, kidding. It's probably one of the only ones available in the country. Yeah, it's it's about a 
the, the price of a couple cases of nine <laughs> yeah. millimeter bullets. <laughs> yeah, you joke. It's a good trade. Absolutely. Yeah, so Jason, a, let's talk about, we've got guess kind of what we're, we're, yeah. we're how we're going to look going forward. I mean, we've got, we've got a variety of guests lined up, you know, we're going to do, so the podcast, we're calling it season two. Yeah. Um, season two is going to be a little bit more of our, you know, we're getting, we're getting away from the play around stage. We, 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 I think we put out some good content last season, yeah. Um, but it was a lot of learning on it. I think we're that that year that we took off. We we kind of know what we we got our stuff together, right? Um, so we're gonna have some guests coming on. You know, a lot of the hunting industry is gonna come on. We're gonna have some target stuff. Um, definitely gonna have some some tech episodes where we're gonna bore you about FOC and <laughs> arrow builds again and all that stuff that Bridger loves to talk about. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> but we're also, and I'm gonna give you guys the warning now we're going to have some episodes out there that are not going to be suitable for children yeah we talked um, about that we're gonna we're gonna have some kickback um uh, laid back episodes with some some people out there that you guys have seen on social media that like to definitely have some colorful speech where you're going to be hearing instead of doing a whole bunch of <laughs> we're just gonna <laughs> let you guys know hey you know what this was uh, not for kids yeah exactly um so yeah, we're gonna we're gonna be talking about elk hunting with some people out there. We're gonna be talking about how to make a good cup of coffee with other people. Yeah. Um, we're gonna be talking some military stuff, some right. some veteran programs that we're putting together. So I think it's gonna be an interesting season uh, of the the new show, the right. new revamp, and obviously having it on video. You guys are gonna be able to see it, and and you know this is this is our pilot episode for season two so right. i think it's going to get a little bit more colorful a little bit more exactly energetic we'll work on the yeah so we are going to be posting on youtube for sure mm -hmm. um so there'll be more live so bridget yeah. and i can't pick our noses and stuff like that and do it, colorful things it's hard yeah no kidding it's hard not to uh, do it. and the other thing is is that to jason's point we're going to really expand our coverage to talk about a little bit of everything yeah and that's exciting i mean it's going to be cool yeah. Because we had debated that even last year when mm -hmm. we did this. Man, do, you know, we have a lot of kids that listen to our podcast, of course, because of some of our guests. And we need that. To, yeah, yeah. And we need those kids to listen. But, you know, parents, be careful because we, I know of a couple of guests we're going to have and they're not going to be clean. Um, they're, they're wild, man. <laughs> but I mean, it's, but it's everyday life. It is. You know, exactly. Uh, unfortunately, we do, we do have one of the most family friendly sports. Correct. But there are some aspects of it where people are kind of raw. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, you can't you can't force someone to be a certain way because it completely takes away from yeah what they bring to the table. Well, the other thing is that, and Bridger, you and I have talked about this for a long time, our sport needs that. It needs a little bit of colorful personalities. Bridger said this we a thousand times. Well, <laughs> I'll get a kick out. We are full of geeks, right? Oh yeah, we're just a bunch of nerds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got this p poster of this S3DA poster in our shop, and and I remember one time Bridger walked back and he looks and he's, those are all nerds. Yeah, <laughs> there's not a cool kid there, oh. uh, and not we're not knocking the sport, but our sport definitely needs some some to integrate some personality into it, and we're going to do that on our podcast for sure. We definitely need the. The input of personalities. We yeah. need that Aaron Rodgers drama. Oh yeah, going on. Like I want to hear about Levi Morgan is not happy with his yeah. manufacturer. And yeah, something, something, something to make it interesting. But drama. Yeah, it, it's going to be fun. It's definitely going to be fun um, having some of those people come on the show and actually join us as a guest. Yeah, I think it's going to be better and people being able to put a a face to the to the person behind the mic. You know, yeah. it was really cool when. I was at an after party attack and somebody was talking about the, the podcast and, and Craig, one of, one of uh, your customers is like, yeah, that's Jason from the podcast. And the guy was like, really? <laughs> that's you. I'm like, yeah, dude, I'm the quiet one. Yeah. Not, no. not going to happen next year. No way. I, I, no. I got to talk more front and center. Yeah, absolutely. So now there's going to be a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of stuff that we want to do for the people too. Yeah. So, you know, the, the, Instagram page is going to go back up and start being a little bit more active. So guys just go on there and, and, and give us your input. Tell us what you want to, yeah. what you want to hear. Um, and again, we're not going to sit here for two hours talking about string building and, and 
center serving and all that stuff yeah. and bore you to death. Not on every episode. I, I still think this is a big core of, of what got us to where we were. I yeah. think the one thing I always heard that, that we were different, we were highly educational, and we were giving the facts behind the science, mm-hmm. meaning that there are so many guys out there that regurgitate common knowledge and don't understand why. And mm-hmm. that part of it drives me bananas. That's the guys that I have zero respect for that yeah. are going on uh, goldtip.com to, to regurgitate FOC um, and can't tell you why. They have no clue. Uh, and it drives me absolutely bananas. We're going to give you the why, the yeah. facts behind the science and tell you this is why this works or why, why it doesn't work. And Lord knows you don't want to get me on my soapbox. on Go down the crap. paper tuning rabbit hole. Yeah, I'm bad. I mean, we just talked about this day before yesterday. Gosh. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, there's exactly. there's going to be some ranting. There's going to be some rabbit holes. Yeah, don't, be, don't get them all worked up before we <laughs> even open up the oh, no, store. No, no, no. no. <laughs> no, no. Well, exactly. I want to get them worked up on the show. Maybe yeah. get a little, bit of, a little bit of high voices and stuff going. We'll, we'll start talking about top hats and... And all that good stuff on Matthew's bows. And yeah. No, <laughs> don't. Seriously. <laughs> it'll, but, be, it'll, it'll be entertaining, but it gets my blood pressure up. Yeah. So. It's it's going to be fun. Yeah, I'm absolutely. excited for it. Um, we'll keep you guys posted on the rest of the season. So what are we doing on content? Weekly? Yeah, we're definitely going to try and put it out weekly. Okay. You know, with the video and with everything. We want to give everybody a good, a good product. Right. Not going to be something... That sounds like we sat in our garage with a little tape recorder. Right. And honestly, you look at this here, and this is funny because Bridger just kind of cracked on it, and he's right. We got our leading edge archery sign back here, and it's held up by duct tape, which is awesome. At least it's teal duct tape. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, you know, okay, so I'm going I'm to tell you, the reason that duct tape is there, believe it or not, that sign is actually paper. And those grommets had ripped off the corners. Oh, really? Oh. We actually used that sign at a Total Archery Challenge event last year when our, our booth got wiped out mm-hmm. by the storm. <laughs> Remember, I don't know if you get, you guys want to hear about that, but it was horrible. And uh, that's the remnants of it. So we're going to try to up that also. We'll get some better. I know we're going to have Roger Koss, one of our, our in-house carpenters, is going to look at getting us a good table built. So yeah. to try to work on this format, because if we're going to do video, but this is going to be raw, this is kind of the way we are right now yeah and could get a better couch because that couch is kind of nasty it's it's gonna it's gonna turn into who we are what yeah, we are exactly because we're not gonna give them the hey this this is what we are yeah. on the show and you know i don't no. want to be a fake person no. i know no. you're definitely not gonna be fake and no neither is bridger no. so today there's coffee cups tomorrow there might be some Bud bush lights. lattes and <laughs> Some bush latte. Yeah. Bush and latte does not go together. It'd be more like a. Oh, they do. Oh. They, yes, they do. Actually, Bridger, I just discovered something that you might like. The new uh, Shiner, mm. um, like, seltzer drinks. Oh, oh no. I haven't had those yet. They're okay. I, I had one that was watermelon. You just, that was horrible. Well, I'm sure it's good when it's cold. You had it hot? Oh, it was it was bubbling hot. So speaking of beer, real quick, we went to dinner the other night, me and a couple of guys. Um, I found out a Kolsch mm-hmm. dark, whatever. Is that sound yeah. right? It tastes like milk, chocolate milk. Yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh. It's, was it amazing? Probably a nitro. A milk, milk stout? Yeah. As a, maybe a nitro. Dude, it, it was so nitro. good. Yeah. But I can imagine if I had two of those, I'm out. <laughs> I'm done. I mean, done, done for the well, night. Well, there's, there's a couple local uh, brewers. Mm-hmm. that I that I was able to meet that we might have on the show cuz oh, they're, they're archers and they're outdoorsmen. Yeah. They're prior military and they're brewers and they're local. Oh yeah, there you so go. So I know that we Sign might actually up. go and record a show at, at their, their brewery. Shop. Yeah, it'd be better cuz yeah. this thing's mobile now, so. Yeah. I'm and we good. got the, we got video guy back here and I'm going to make him mobile, so. Yeah. All right. So, all, all right. right guys, we appreciate you uh hanging out with us and uh we'll catch you on the next one. All right. We'll see you.